Well, come on and give God praise for a God who is in control. Come on, you can do better than that. He is a God who is in, he just not in control. He is in complete control. There is nothing outside of the realm of God's control. Can you bless God again for our praise and worship ministry? Brother Trey, thank y'all reminding us that God is in control when we are at our weakest and we're struggling. Brother Trey said that we can declare that we already know the end of the story. How many of you know the end of the story? No matter what our journey is, we win. Somebody ought to shout, we win. If you're watching us online today, you ought to declare in the comment section that we win. Listen, the Bible talks about how Paul took a journey on a ship and he declared to those on the ship that unless you stay on the ship, you won't survive. But the Bible said that the ship wrecked anyway. How many of you been there before? Somebody told you everything was going to be all right, but the ship wrecked anyway. But how many you know the Bible says that, listen, they may all didn't come in all right, but some of them came in on some broken pieces. I believe I got some broken piece folk up in the house today that, listen, I made it. I struggled, but I'm in. I came in on broken pieces. Somebody had to dog paddle. Somebody had to backstroke. Somebody had to hold on for their life. Some of us even had to have mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, but we made it. This. All at the end of the day is that we win and we celebrate. Come on, celebrate the name of our God in this place again. Hallelujah. While we're celebrating God, can we celebrate the man of God who is on assignment in the kingdom of God? Come on, in a person, Reverend Dr. Charles E. Goodman, Jr., man of God, we celebrate you, we love you, and we thank God for you. Would you pray with me as we begin this journey today in the word of God? God, we love you today and we bless you how we count it all joy to be standing in this place of worship today in this sanctuary in this holy place we thank you God for being able to kneel at your feet and to look up into the eyes of an all loving God and we thank you God for who you are to us we worship you God because you're worthy to be praised we count it all joy to be in your presence, God, even when we sometimes don't feel joyful. But we thank you for covering us and watching us. And now, God, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts, may it be acceptable in your sight. You are literally our strength, and you certainly are our redeemer. And we give you praise, and we give you glory in Jesus' name. And wherever you are, you ought to just put those hands together and say amen. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Listen, those in the sanctuary, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. So good and so grateful to God and the man of God for giving his dream team opportunity to share the word of God to you. How many of you have been blessed by this Advocate series? Come on. Amen. Just been truly a blessing. Let me just share that over the last six weeks we've talked about the advocate as our helper, right? One who comes alongside of us and assists us. It all comes out of the context where Jesus says, do not let your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. He said, I'm going away, but I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when I go, I'm going to send someone here who is going to walk with you every step of the way. How many of you are grateful for the Holy Spirit? We've needed him as our helper. He also says that he's going to lead him, leave him as our teacher, one who will instruct us, right, and guide us, our interceder, one who, how many know that when you can't, don't know what to pray for, the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us on our behalf to God. Our provider, he gives gifts and he gives us wisdom and insight to the plans and the things of God. God doesn't give all people insight to who he is, all right? Only to his believers, only to those who are his, his chosen ones, those who've decided to accept him, he gives you insight. He's not going to leave us ignorant to the things of God and the things of the kingdom. 
and we're grateful for him being a provider. And then last week, Pastor talked about the advocate being our protector. How many grateful that you've been covered in the blood of the lamb? When you couldn't keep yourself, we don't always celebrate this, but it's not just about the things you know you missed. How many of you grateful for being covered with things you didn't know you missed? A route you didn't, didn't take that you, you thought you were going to take. A phone call you thought you were going to make that you glad you didn't make it. Come on, somebody. A direction you were going to go that you grateful you didn't go. God protects us even when we cannot protect ourselves. Well, today we're going to be closing this series out. And again, we thank God for the man of God sharing this series with him. But we're going to share this thought about the, the advocate being our restore. Everybody say restore. You can remain seated, but we're going to t- cover two scriptures today. Uh, two, two, two scriptures out of one, this one passage. Psalms 51, if you have your Bibles. Psalms 51 at verse 11 and 12. We're going to be reading out of the New King James Version, but if your Bible says Bible, you're in good shape. Psalms 51, 11 and 12 says, Do not cast me away from your presence. This is David talking to the Lord. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me by your generous spirit. Somebody say generous spirit. We're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit, this advocate as our restore. Everybody say restore. If you don't mind, I just want to slow this and slow walk this with you. And as we dive into what it means for the Holy Spirit to be our restore. We're going to talk about how the Holy Spirit is our restore that provides joy and sustenance to those who are disconnected from God, which is a reminder that God constantly forgives and reclaims us. How many of you grateful for the Holy Spirit? Uh, In a sermon that he preached um, back in the early 2000s, David Rumley, while he was talking about Uh, the lost and uh, how that God does not hold sin against us once we uh, repent and ask for forgiveness. He was talking about Abraham Lincoln's uh, attitude toward restoring the South during the Civil War. It says that when President Lincoln was asked how he would treat the rebellious Southerners when they were defeated. This is what he said. I will treat them as if they'd never been away. That's a powerful statement considering the conditions of the Civil War. But when we sin and fault and fail, how many you know we are separated from God's presence? But it is God's desire to reclaim us and treat us as if we'd never been away. We all sin. We all sin. We all have faults and we all experience failures. The word of God says in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned all have sinned. Let me help define all for you. All means all. All have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. When we realize though and we confess our failures, God will restore us back unto himself. Matter of fact, Isaiah eleven eleven says this, it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again, watch this, the second time. Some of us are way past our second time. Tell them we just thank God for this time. It shall come to pass in that day that God was set his hand a second time to, watch this, recover 
the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt and from Pathros and Cush, from Elam, from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea and tell them, and even where I live. It does not matter who you are. It does not matter where you are. God wants to reclaim you and restore you when you have become separated from him. That's good news to somebody. Our sin nature, somebody say sin nature. Our sin nature constantly separates us from the presence of God and the advocate, the Holy Spirit, constantly provides opportunities for us to be restored back to God. It's just simply a life cycle. We sin, we mess up, the Holy Spirit is there staying in the gap to restore us back to God. I'm going to say it again. We sin, we mess up, the Holy Spirit is there constantly to restore us back to God. We sin, we mess up, the Holy Spirit is constantly there to restore us back to God. I'm going to say it one more time to you understand that we sin and we mess up. And the Holy Spirit is there standing in the gap to constantly restore us to God. Now, a restorer is uh, someone uh, uh, who uh, restores something to its um, original condition, right? Uh, uh, the Bible says to Jesus, listen, you must be born uh, again. That was an original condition that we existed in. Who we are now may not be really who God purposed for us to be. Life just simply has a way of making us look different. <laughs> Come on, somebody. A restorer uh, uses um, tools, though, um, to scrape away uh, things like paint and ex excess wood and things that uh, hide partial work so, so that they can expose the original condition of what they're working on. Now, now, uh, here is a uh, rhetorical question for you. Don't, don't look to your left and don't look to your right. And those of you who are online, please do not put this in the comment section at this time. Who are you underneath all the years of your pain and your grief and your disappointment and your despair and your loss and your sin and your failure and your unforgiveness? What in you, what in us need to be regenerated, resurrected, rejuvenated, revitalized. What in us needs to be restored? Keep your head. Look, look at me. Look at me. <laughs> Psalms 51 is a very interesting text when we talk about the Holy Spirit as a restorer. It, it's, 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 it's laid over another story that, that if you don't look at it, you will miss. It's a very interesting uh, story that uh, in some cases, if we were honest, many of us would probably relate to some of it. Uh, probably not all of it, because when you hear the story in a second, uh, if you relate to all of us, we, some of us might be in jail. But, but we can relate to some of it. It's, it's, it's a story about David and Bathsheba uh, back in 2 Samuel chapter 11. The Bible starts out, a very interesting uh, text. I preached this years and years and years ago about the beauty of sin. So just listen to this. So, so the Bible says that it was in the springtime when the kings were out to war. Stay with me on this. Um, David had sent some of his lieutenants out to the battle. But the Bible says that David stayed home. Now, right there, you ought to catch your attention. Uh, some of us get in trouble, fault, sin, mess up, 
because where we are supposed to be, uh, we're not. Oh, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, all up in that Kool-Aid, yeah, uh-huh, yeah. Uh, you supposed to be at work. Uh, you told them you were going uh, to work, uh, but you decided uh, to stay home or go do something else. So uh, David found himself uh, at home when he, the Bible says that it was a time when the kings went to war. So uh, the devil is always busy. So what happens? David is laying around and lounging around. And the Bible says that early in the morning, David gets up and walks out on his balcony, looks down and sees Bathsheba taking a bath. My, my, my. Uh, he said, uh, who, who that is? He says to his servants, uh, who, who is that? And, and y'all need to go find out who, 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 who that is. Uh, the beauty of sin. Can I tell you that we can laugh at David? Many of us have been attracted to things that did not belong to us. Many of us have slipped, fell, sinned in things that did not belong to us. This woman, Bathsheba, belonged, they told him, they informed him uh, to somebody else. Matter of fact, to one of your, your lieutenants, David, he's the man that fights the battle. He's out there fighting the war. You chilling out, this man going to work. It's one thing to go after something that does not belong to you it's another thing that when uh, you, 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 something happens and, and then you try to cover it up. Here's what happened. David has the woman brought to his suite. Come on, somebody. And uh, uh, loves on her, sends her back home. Come on, brothers. And, and, and then he got a text. <laughs> he got that phone call. Uh, come on, brothers. Uh, Look straight, look at me. Uh, David, um, we need to talk. Um, David, uh, I, I'm, I'm expecting. So now David, yeah, mm-hmm, is right, mm-hmm. So now David has to figure out what am I going to do about this because I have now sinned not only against God, but against somebody else's wife and this man, this man and his wife. So what does David do? He schemed, he connived. So David said, well, listen, uh, y'all go get Uriah and bring, bring him on back here. And, uh, and then if I, if, if I do it right, I'll send him to the house, sleep with his wife, and then she, we won't know who the baby, they didn't have DNA testing back then. We won't know who the baby <laughs> We don't know who the baby belongs to, right? Uh, uh, that didn't work. Uriah uh, came, uh, said, well, uh, uh, David sent him home to his wife, woke him next morning, Uriah laying at, at, outside the door. David opened up the door, Uriah, Uriah laying right there. I said, man, you didn't go home? He said, no, I didn't go home. So David had to come up with another scheme. Let me see. Uh, tell Uriah, come on, go, come on in here, and, and, and we're going to drink. We're going to eat, we're going to throw a party, and we're going to have a whole lot of fun. Then, without him knowing, I'm going to send him home, and he's going to wake up. You, some of somebody, we done had a Friday night, a Saturday morning like that. We'd have woke up and just figure out where we were. How did I get here? That did not work. Uriah woke up still outside the door. So, finally, David got the notion, this is what we're going to do. We're going to send him back out on the battlefield. And if just so happened, while y'all shooting arrows at the enemy, if one just so happened to fall and hit Uriah and kill him, we're going to say, oh, what a tragedy, Uriah is dead. Mm-hmm. Sin has a way of uh, making us go outside the extreme boundaries that it already has us in concocting things. What, what we say, if you tell one lie, some of y'all done lied. <laughs> Sins, false and fake, sometimes isolate us. They make us feel 
alone. They make us feel lonely. They make us feel isolated. But how many of you know that God is a restorer? God sends the man of God after all of this happens. The man of God comes to David and convicts him and immediately David repents. Somebody say repent. And I know some of us will categorize this and say, now, wait a minute. Now, a whole lot more should have happened to David. He didn't have somebody killed. He didn't got this woman pregnant and had this baby, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I got it. But how many of you are grateful that God restored you out of your mess that don't nobody know about? It's easy for us to look at the text and read it and judge. Listen, in, in, in my life, there is a closet. Um, that closet, no one will ever have access to. As a matter of fact, it's got a double lock on it. You know that double lock where it takes a key to get in and to get out. I have no idea where the key is. There are always going to be things in our lives we do not want to be exposed for fear of judgment. But how many know that God does not judge us? He just simply wants to restore us. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Psalms 34 and 18 said that the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and he saves such who have a contrite spirit. Psalms 34 and 19 concludes by saying that many are the affliction of the righteous, but watch this, the Lord delivers us out of all of them. He will deliver us from our sins and from our failures. And he will restore us back to his presence. There are three things really quick I want to highlight on here and go through with you to talk about how God really uh, uses the advocates, uses the spirit of God that restores us back into his presence. How many of you want to be restored back to the presence of God? Number one, the advocate restores a bridge back to God. A bridge back to God. We already talked about how sin and failure separates us from the presence of God. The spirit is there. He is left here to restore us, to reconnect us, if you will, back to the presence of God. God cannot handle Sin. God does not abide in our sin. He will always love us. He just cannot deal with us when we sin. He has to turn his back to us. Reverend Z preached this morning downtown, a very powerful message, talked about that's why he had to turn his back on Jesus while he was on the cross because his body was filthy with sin, our sin, the sin of the world. God loved his son, but he cannot tolerate or be in proximity to sin. So sin separates us, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, provides a bridge for us to reconnect with God. While God always loves us, sin and fault separates us. But before we can be restored, before we start the trek on the bridge to be reconnected to God, I want to suggest to you that restoration begins with reconciliation. Bear with me on this. Restoration begins with reconciliation. Reconciling with oneself, reconciling with others, and reconciling with God. Watch this. David's confession in Psalm 51 and 3 says this. Here is the very powerful thing that we have to embrace before we start the journey across the bridge. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is always before me. I'm going to let you sit in that a second. The first thing we have to do is to acknowledge that we were wrong. I don't care what your wrong is, and let me just remind you in case you just forgot that this applies to the person sitting beside you, all have sinned. Whether you, uh, uh, it's a visible sin or it's an internal sin. We are by nature sinful. Thought, we fail, we make mistakes. Whether someone sees you or not, or whether the lights are on or not, all of us fall short. And the first thing that we have to do is to reconcile with ourselves that we fall short. And we also have to recognize that falling short and failure sometimes impact 
impact the lives of the people who are associated with us. Do you know how many people were impacted by what David did? The lives that were changed and altered because you made a decision to stay at home and to not go where you were supposed to be and went out on your balcony and went after something you weren't supposed to have and brought something back to your place that wasn't supposed to be brought back. My dad used to tell my sisters, don't come back here with nothing you did not take. Some of us need to live on that. See, reconcile with others. And then, at the end of the day, whether we sin publicly or privately, all of it is sin toward God. It impacts our relationship with God. It impacts our presence with God. So David's confession that I acknowledge my transgression, my sin is always before me, is a very powerful uh, beginning to crossing that bridge. While the advocate restores the bridge back to God, we must decide to utilize it. How many of you are grateful for grace and mercy? And in our collaboration, Reverend Richardson says something very powerful about the nature of a bridge. You know, when when you're about to enter onto a bridge, especially in a small rural country, it would have the weight limit on the bridge. Can I declare to you today that no matter what we've done, no matter what we've faulted at, no matter what mistakes we've made, God can handle your weight limit. So as we begin to come back, understand that God can handle you coming back to him. But restoration, though, begins with our mind. It it begins with us making up our mind that we are going to confess, that we are going to be reconciled, and that we're going to begin this journey back to God. As a matter of fact, Romans 12 and 2 says, uh, don't be conformed to this world, but here it is, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Ephesians 4.22 says something that I didn't see before except in study. It says, it says that you put off concerning the former conduct. Watch this. The former conduct that the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful flesh, watch this, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Here's what I concluded from that. Our conduct is in direct correlation or relationship with our mindset. It makes sense when Jesus says, as a man thinketh, so is he. It has to direct correlation with our behavior. If we want to change our behavior, if we want to change our nature as we cross back over that bridge and connect back with God, we first got to change our minds. We have to decide that God has forgiven us. And then we get our feet to moving across the bridge that connects us back to God because God can handle you coming back. Touch somebody and say, God can handle you coming back. Let me just say this parenthetically, that others may decide that your sins and faults and failures do not warrant reconciliation. There are people you messed up and who have messed up in your life who have decided that is it and there is no reconciling. But that's not the nature of God. How many of you are grateful for the nature of God? When I mess up, you may not accept me back. But I'm grateful that God is not like man that he should lie. It's not over. Paul says in Philippians 1 and 6, being confident is one thing that he who has begun a good work in you, he will, he will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. The sin nature, the faults and failures that we experience in our lives on a daily basis don't cut us short as it relates to the intentions of God for our life. Once God has spoken over your life, you will arrive at the mediated goal that God has set for your life. What God has told you will come to pass. The advocate restores a bridge back to God. Number two, not only does he restore a bridge back to God, the advocate restores our place in God. Somebody say our place in God. You say, well, Woods, now isn't that the same? No, let me me walk you through why that's not the same. Uh, A place can be defined as a situation that one might um, find themselves in. David found himself... uh, in a situation. Uh, It is a set of circumstances 
uh, in which one finds uh, themselves, or, or, or it, could, it, it could be, a, a, it's a state of affairs. It's, it's, it's where you, find, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the situation between uh, her and Jake, we call him Jake. The situation between her and Jake came to a head. Okay, all right. Um, some relationships do not allow uh, for you to get your place back with them. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, once the nature of the relationship has been uh, defiled, sometimes we don't get our, quote, place back uh, we, as we had prior to the defiling. Okay, one more. Okay. Um, once you mess up with me, ain't no coming back this way. Uh, I thought that would hit some of y'all. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And if you do come back this way, uh, don't expect things to be the same as they were before uh, you got up out of here. Okay, that's why I go. There you are. There you are. There you are. There you are. Uh huh. Um, our sins, our failures create a breaking, if you will, in the relationship with God. And there are consequences to that, right? But however, David submitted this. He said, God, I know I did wrong, but if you could restore to me the joy of your salvation. He, here's what David was saying. Uh, I know what I did caused separation in our relationship. However, could you please restore back to me uh, that which I lost? What did I lose? I lost the joy of your salvation. Can I get back what I lost? Uh-huh. You got some people right now asking you that question. Yeah, uh-huh, go on that, yeah, uh-huh, yeah. Y'all saying, I wish, I, I wish, y'all got them blocked right now. They can't text you, they can't call you, and they bet not do a drive-by. You said, no, 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 we can speak. I wave at you when I see you. Uh, matter of fact, I can love you, but across the street. David says that the joy can only come from you, but I want my place back that I had with you. Is it possible, God, for me to reclaim what I lost by my own hands? The songwriter says that even when the enemy is me. How, don't raise your hand. It's rhetorical again. But how many of you have been in relationships that you've messed up? You've had to send a text. You've had to make a phone call. You've had to knock on the door. You've had to get somebody to go down there because the person won't answer the door for you. You trying to do whatever you can to make up for that lost relationship. It does not feel good being separated from the presence of God. It is a scary thought to think that one might not be in good standing with God. Matter of fact, I just heard a song this morning, uh, trade them singing all the time, oh Jesus, your presence is heaven to me. Paul says in Hebrews 10, 15 and 18, but, everybody say but, thank God for a but, but the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us that after he had said before, this is the covenant, we ought to thank God for a covenant that I made with them after those days that I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds, I will write them, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. How many of you are grateful that God throws our sins in the sea of forgetfulness. Second Samuel, David was king when he sinned. But because he confessed his sins, he, when he was restored, he was still king. I'm going to say it again. David was king when he sinned, and he was still king after he repented and was restored. David got his place back with God. Can I just tell you this? I may not get my place back with you. 
Our relationship might not be the same. You might determine that you will never talk to old Woody Woods again. But I'm so glad I don't need your permission to be reconciled with a God who sees beyond my faults and he sees my needs. David did not lose his place in God and we should not have to lose our place in God either. Let me close this point with this illustration. I recently flew out of Hartsfield, Atlanta Hartsfield Airport. Yeah, uh uh-huh. Y'all know about the lines in Hartsville Airport. Remember, right, I'm in line, and y'all know when you get my age, the first thing you look for is a restroom. (laughs) And you know, they've got this now where they have these attendants where the line is so long that when there's an aisle going this way, uh, they have you to hold so people can walk through when the line on the other side of the aisle uh, digresses a little bit, then they let you go through. I'm steady standing in this line. I'm looking at the bathroom sign and I'm looking how far down we still got to go. I still got to get to the first taper rope. I still got to get right there. Then I got to do this. And I'm looking. I ain't got to go now, but I'm anticipating. So people don't play in Atlanta, but I realized that Atlanta is an international airport. So surely everybody in the airport ain't from Atlanta and don't have the mentality of the Atlanteans. So uh, I'm looking at the lady in front of me and I turn kind of sideways looking my peripheral at the gentleman behind me. And I'm thinking, I got to ask one of them to save my place in line. I'm going to that, where that sign says restroom. Uh, So I'm waiting and you know how you look at people and you're trying to measure them. You, uh, can I say something? Can I, you know, you're trying to get that eye contact. You you know how we do when we walk into a room when ain't a whole lot of us and we just won't just, you know, we just, we just won't just get an eye connection. So finally, I realized that the gentleman behind me with the red beard uh, is okay. So I said, hey, man, I got, listen, I'm going to go on and make my run, uh, and then I'll be back. If you hold my place, man, I got you because I got to go too. I said, cool. <laughs> so I tell the attendant, hey, I'm not breaking line. I just need to go right there. She said, by all means, she unhooks it. She lets me go. I come back out from using the restroom. I don't see the red-headed beard guy, and I'm like... Where is he? And I'm looking and I'm going, oh, and then I see a hand down in now in, in the trash there, right? He, he throws his hands up and, and now I got to go past all these people that were behind us. Why? I go right back, watch this, to the place I was in before I had to go to the bathroom. All I'm trying to tell somebody is that we don't lose our place in line when it comes to God. It's okay to step out. It's okay because when we come back, anybody else, somebody else might treat you wrong. Somebody else say, no, you can't get this back. You got to go back to the end of the land. But how many of you are grateful to a God for a God who says, no, 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 no. You get a chance to come right back here where you left off. The advocate restores our place in God. He restores our bridge back to God, our place in God. And lastly, the advocate restores our joy with God. Lord, have mercy. The years of pain and grief and disappointment and despair and sin and mess-ups and loss and unforgiveness, it has a way of stripping away our joy. You ever looked at someone and realized that life just... You know, Medea said, Medea, Tyler Perry Medea, what happened to her? Life. Life happened to her. Life has a way of wearing you down and make you, making you not look like who you originally looked like. Life, 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 people in life. My daddy used to say, son, how, how's life? No, life is fine, just some of the people that's in it. Right? Life has a way of wearing at you, breaking you down, taking away your joy. But how many you know that God is a restorer of joy? 
Reverend Stewart in our collaboration said something very powerful, that God flipped the script on David. It's amazing that we know the story about David, but yet we always celebrate that he was a man after God's own heart. How do you know that God got one heck of a comeback story for all of us? Oh, you see me now. Oh, you see me now. Oh, you just keep looking at me. You just keep looking at me and watch God do amazing things in my life. Now you can, rem listen, I don't have a reason to deny what I did. But somebody said, look at me now. Oh, look at me now. Look at me now. David said, look at me now. God flipped the script on David. That his sin nature now was in God's rearview mirror. And now God celebrated him as a man after his own, his own heart. Jo our joy can be restored in God. Job, a man who had possession, it's a story of possessions and loss and restoration. He lost his family. He lost his possessions. He lost all that he had. But how many of you know that God gave Job double for his trouble? It has a way of stripping us down. It has a way of taking us out. It has a way of making us feel like even when we're in the presence of God, that joy is the one thing that is absent from our life. That's why we ought to be careful about measuring joy against happiness. Happiness is based upon your happenings. When your happenings ain't happening like you want them to happen, you ain't happy no more. But this joy that I have, Lord have mercy, the world didn't give it to me and the world can't take it away. The prodigal son the prodigal son made a mistake and decided he wanted to go ahead of his father's wishes. But in the end, when he came back home, how I many you know that his father welcomed him back home and put him right back in the place where he was by his side, killed the fatty calf and put his robe on his back and said, this is my son. You're not going to lose your place and become a servant. I'm bringing you back to be my son. Jesus restored sight to the blind, the ability to walk to the crippled, the hearing to the deaf. When the man had a disease of the skin, Jesus restored the skin. But in all these accounts, Jesus didn't restore, just restore their condition. He healed their faith and had them to reclaim their joy. You saw plenty of examples in the New Testament where Jesus healed and delivered and they went leaping for joy and celebrating and telling people about the goodness of the Lord. That's what God, that's what God does when he restores our joy. You can go around and tell someone, that, listen, I know what you've been through. I may not have been through what you've been through, but let me tell you how you can get your joy back. That's how you can encourage somebody to lift their head up, O oh ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors. Why? Because the king of glory, he come, he shall come in. Who is this king of glory? He is the Lord God Almighty. He is the king of glory. Lift up your heads, O oh ye gates, and the king of glory will come in. He will restore our joy. Nehemiah proclaims that for the joy of the Lord is our strength. Restoration is a consistent regenerating action. And as much as we sin, equally as much as the restoration and the consistent presence of the Holy Spirit is in our lives. I'm going to say it again. You sin, we can be restored. You fought, we can be restored. You mess up, we can be Now listen, I'm not talking about restored from people. You let people think what they think. I'm talking about with God. You mess up, you can be restored. You sin, you can be restored. You fall, you can. It's just really just that simple with God. You confess it on a daily basis and every day you will be restored. When God restores us, it is permanent and so is our joy in it. Because this world didn't give us this joy and this world cannot take it away. Now, let me just close by saying this. Now, just uh, parenthetically, you're going to have people who think that they can help you uh, with walking this restoration walk. Um, there are some people who do repairs, but they ain't restores. Some people will try to submit to fix you, to repair you, to uh, help you identify what's broken in your life. But there's a difference between being repaired and being restored. <laughs> to repair me is to fix me as I was. 
not as I am. I am being the present tense. I'm going to say it again. To fix me, to repair me is to fix me as I was. It's, it's, I'm still, listen, that's why, um, um, uh, when, when, when we are to be rejuvenated and when, uh, we are to be, uh, reconciled and when we are to repent, it simply means that we go in the opposite direction. We don't turn this way. No, 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 no. We're still the same. We have to turn our back and go the opposite direction. Restoration means literally that we are going to be restored to our original condition. What does that mean? That now when we are restored, we don't have to worry about you seeing us the way we messed up. God sees us through the blood of Jesus and he sees us the way he intends to see us. So restoration means that God, however you intended for me to be, that's what I look like to you. You can talk about me all you want to. You can talk about, oh, Woods did this, no, Woods did that. But God sees me through the blood of Jesus Christ. And God's love is, 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 is to forgive us and to reclaim us and to restore us. And can I tell you, Another reason that repair, restoration is totally different from repair. To restore something means to restore it to its, not only its original dimension, but also to its value. How many know you are valued? You value by God. You mean something to God. It's worth God's effort to reclaim you and to bring you back into his joy. You don't have to mean all that to other folks. As long as you know your value to our God. Come on and give him praise in this place. Lord, have mercy. Woo! I feel God in this place. I feel God in this place. Woo! I feel God in this place. Bless your name, God. Stand to your feet wherever you are. Lord, have mercy. I feel God in this place. Grateful to be restored to a God who can see past my faults and she my needs. To a God who knows me better than the person in my life. A God who's been with me since birth and is gonna be with me when I transition off this earth. A God whose love is unconditional. A God who sees me for who I am, not for what I do. Lord, have mercy, you ought to give God praise. Woo! Thank you, Lord. Bless your name. God, we love you today and we bless you. Thank you for being the restorer of our lives. Thank you for this advocate series that's blessed us. Thank you, God, for how you walk with us and talk with us. And you told us that we are your own. Thank you, God, for seeing us in ways that others do not see us. Thank you for looking past our sins, our faults, and our failures. Thank you, God, for remembering our sins no more. But thank you, God, for the opportunity to confess our sins before you. Thank you for the opportunity to still come before your throne of grace. Thank you for new mercies every day. And thank you for them twin cousins called grace and mercy. Lord, have mercy. God, we love you and we bless you for who you are in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, clap those hands and give God some praise in here. Come on, bless God. Bless God for those watching online. For those of you who are in our tab global space, listen, we love to connect with you. If that's just simply through the person of Jesus Christ, you need to know who this restorer is that can restore your life. Maybe you sat where you sat and walked where you've been walking today listening to this message. And maybe this message touched you in a way that says, you know what, I need to be restored. Can I tell you, you don't need somebody to repair you. You need somebody to restore you. And that person is in the person of Jesus Christ. If that is you, please connect. You see the ways you can connect at the bottom of your screen. Please reach out. We love to connect with you. If you need to connect with a ministry that knows what it is to fault and sin and fail and yet still be restored, Tabernacle is your place. And Reverend Dr. Charles E. Goodman is your pastor. Listen, we ain't perfect. That's how we know about restoration. We ain't perfect. You be a part of this. We'd be so grateful to have you. Come on, Tab, in person. Let's bless God for those who are working online. Thank you so much for being here. We love you. Hope that you connect with us, and we'll see you next time. Amen.